Welcome to TPA Global Webinar. Um, my name is Maria Grigorieva. I'm Senior Manager with TPA Global. And today we're going to talk about tax risk management. So the world of taxation is changing, as you probably uh, realized, and it's changing rapidly. IRS countries and institutions are introducing different tax standards. And when mapping these standards, uh, one can see that some of the new norms are based on uh, law, uh, while others are more uh, uh, tend to be on uh, economic aspects. And these controversial uh, measures are leading to multiple issues, such as that OECD uh, drives uh, value chain analysis next to traditional transactional transfer pricing. Uh, OECD as well challenges the remote presence uh, in the light of digital economy. Uh, tax authorities around the globe are taking opportunistic positions on uh, margins and also limit uh, tax deductions. And even uh, lead, that leads to uh, double taxation sometimes. Uh, in addition, tax authorities are asking increasingly big amount of content beyond uh, already introduced local file, master file, and similar requirements. Uh, and that, of course, all uh, results in increased amount of cross-border tax disputes uh, and tax risk, tax risk becoming reputational. That even sometimes leads to political clashes, such as the one between U.S. and European Union, in terms of European Union attacking uh, American corporations uh, on tax. So, with these changes in mind, we think that uh, there would be a significant change in uh, timeline for tax assessment. Uh, if previously it could take up to eight years from the date of transaction to the final assessment, uh, now it is expected that it would shrink only to 18 months. And that uh, would happen uh, due to application of real-time uh, software analytics and also uh, various information pre-filings. Uh, such as uh, the one done through ICAP or, for example, uh, horizontal monitoring procedures. And due to these changes that we foresee, uh, we think that taxpayers uh, need to change their typical cycle, uh, which was previously design the transaction, implement the transaction document, then undergo into audit, and then only defend it. They would need to change it and start with a defense. So you first, uh, even before uh, designing the transaction, you would need to think how you're going to defend it, and only then uh, have the design implemented, documented, and undergo the audit fully prepared for the defense. Uh, so uh, with these changes, uh, with uh, that much external and internal pressure, one need to think of a good approach uh, to address the tax risk management. And uh, in a holistic manner, uh, we think that approach could have the six steps. And uh, the first step is uh, to uh, address the data, because without firm grip on information, uh, you cannot uh, prioritize uh, the risks, and you would end up just firefighting whenever uh, things appear and whenever new issues arise. Secondly, uh, through no compliance uh, is sometimes a burden, uh, you definitely need to address it and you need to organize it in the most efficient and straightforward way. Uh, this would allow uh, to structure the information that you arrange in step one uh, and find your one version of the truth that can be done reported uh, externally and also used internally for different purposes. Uh, in addition, it of course allows you to decrease risk of uh, penalties for non-compliance. Uh, once these two basic steps are done, you can move to a more fancy uh, things, uh, which is risk planning and provisioning. 
And in uh, this part, you can use various tools and methods to identify, map, uh, and analyze risk. And uh, in this step, you can also use software, of course, to perform your analytics and planning. Uh, and uh, you can also use uh, quantitative VCA, for example, about which I'm going to uh, talk a little bit later. Uh, in step four, uh, you need to uh, also address uh, the uh, governance uh, uh, of your business. And by the governance, uh, we mean the uh, relationship between the management in uh, different companies and uh, allocation of uh, rights and uh, dis decision making responsibilities. Uh, because what happens sometimes, though you did uh, explain everything on paper in the right way and uh, you thought of all your risk in terms of numbers. However, uh, you may find that a uh, director of your one entity is also a director of another one, and that can create a significant risk. So uh, this part definitely needs to be addressed, uh, though, of course, it's uh, always difficult because then you need to talk to business people and maybe in a certain way change the way business operates. And that is, uh, of course, uh, complicated because you may undermine even the profit. Uh, once this is addressed, you can also manage your uh, team, uh, which is a tech team. And in this sense, you need to think that people are moving, people are changing careers, and you need to uh, structure and preserve uh, knowledge in such a way that even when you yourself maybe would want to uh, change the company, uh, this does not lead to a significant disruption of a uh, tax function. Last uh, step uh, is when uh, all five are done and all five are clear, is to communicate it clearly to external stakeholders. And by stakeholders, uh, you can think of the board or the general public uh, and, of course, tax authorities, but also maybe uh, NGOs depending on the nature of your organization. If you have the, uh, this clear holistic approach set, uh, you can address uh, more specific items and more specific tools for the risk management. And today we're going to look at three of them. One is value chain analysis. Uh, the second is uh, controversy management. And the third is tax technology. And I also see that uh, several people joined after we began uh, the webinar. So for them, I just would want to repeat that if you have any questions, you can raise them in the question box of your webinar menu or in the chat box. Uh, so we move to value chain analysis in terms of using it as the risk uh, management tool. Uh, so as you know, with BAP, we moved from typical uh, functional analysis where we had to align legal, financial, and economic reality to value chain analysis, where you have to align your operating model, corporate governance, uh, finance, tax, and transfer pricing model even. And what value chain is, uh, to us, it's one version of the truth, uh, because uh, value chain is used in TP documentation. Uh, value chain can be used in negotiation uh, with the tax authorities as well as in dispute. But also, value chain can be used in communication to the board and to other stakeholders, such as uh, general public uh, or the shareholders of the company. Uh, so uh, with uh, this in mind, I would want to uh, give an example of the value chain. Uh, this is the value chain of the apparel industry. And as you might know, uh, it has changed significantly in the last several years. Uh, so before that, uh, companies were designing clothes, uh, making the clothes, uh, sending it to the shop, and selling to us. Uh, however, with uh, all the uh, in, with introduction of the uh, digitalization, uh, we are now don't want to go to the shop sometimes or we uh, want to buy things that we see in Instagram or uh, in any other way. So companies need to adapt to that. 
and uh, they uh, actually what they do first is they do not just design flows but they uh, look into trends that they see in the market and also social media for example or uh, even using big data to understand what kind of uh, apparel we want to wear tomorrow and only then they do a manufacturing and still delivering clothes but of course, the logistics also change because uh, people don't want to go anymore to the shops, but maybe they want it to be delivered to their house or to uh, any other point uh, in the place where they stay. Uh, and that as well leads to a blend of the channels through which we buy because we can buy uh, things online and pick up in a shop or even order in a shop and then get it delivered to our house. and. Uh, all other ways that you can imagine, which of course leads to a blend uh, of the uh, profits, which was uh, not foreseen before. Uh, and as you also might know, the companies that are working with the pure uh, deliver, uh, web delivery, such as, for example, the Lambda, uh, they, uh, yeah, they just try to actually reduce prices so people buy more. So. What it led to in the market is that the operating margin uh, of the uh, big players have changed. Uh, as you can see, uh, the margins are in general uh, being reduced or um, sometimes they stay at the uh, more or less the same level. Uh, the overall trend in the market is that there is uh, continuous digital disruption and uh, companies need to think uh, what to do with that in terms of the transfer pricing. Because if previously uh, they could have a typical distribu limited distribution hub uh, that receive a fixed margin, now with the margin being reduced, uh, they cannot anymore guarantee it. And they need to think how to justify it, actually. And um, for that, uh, they need to uh, have a clear estimation of uh, how much uh, value do the uh, distribution company bring. Uh, in this case, value chain analysis can help clearly because it first helps you to uh, allocate uh, the functions between the entities and as well as risk. So you can clearly see that the entity that is not bringing, uh, that is not bearing risk is also not bringing value. But you also need to think of the industry factor. So if before maybe uh, the shop was bringing value just, just by the fact of its existence, uh, let's say the shop was standing in a very crowded location so people anywhere were coming to the shop. So now it's not the case. So now maybe the company that uh, actually operates the online sales is the one that brings more value. And this uh, always needs to be taken into account. Um, and uh, with that in mind, you can perform the quantitative uh, value chain analysis. Uh, so as the first step, you would see how you can uh, link it to your transactional transfer pricing. So see how you remunerate uh, each of the functions. Uh, and then uh, you can actually allocate uh, each portion of the function to a, a certain uh, legal entity to see uh, what kind of profit it should really receive. To make it um, more objective, uh, TPA uh, uh, suggests uh, to use what we call anchors. And uh, these anchors uh, are regulatory anchors. For example, OECD guidelines, uh, you can also use country specific anchor, for example, uh, IRS regulation, which provides certain rules of objectivity and also can provide you with uh, certain uh, items that you need to take into account. Uh, as for example, you need to look at the gross profit or if you need to look at the revenue for comparison. Uh, second, you need to look at the industry anchor. And this, as I mentioned, you need to see uh, which are value drivers uh, in the industry at the moment. So is this the sales part or doesn't uh, anymore make sense? It's rather the marketing part or even maybe the uh, fast and efficient procurement brings the uh, biggest chunk of the profit for your company. Uh, of course, for some industries, such as, for example, uh, in uh, finance or uh, insurance, 
you need to look at industry ratios and this could be uh, cost, certain cost ratios or uh, ratios for the profit uh, or even uh, things like return on investment or return on equity. Uh, the last uh, anchor is called uh, best compliant anchor, and that means uh, the certain standards imposed by uh, OECD BEPS papers. And some of them are, for example, comparability. Uh, so you need to make sure that uh, the data that you use uh, for your value chain analysis is truly comparable uh, to the uh, third parties, and that you can really find examples. Uh, in the public domain uh, to uh, uh, compare to your calculations. Second is economic significance. Uh, so you really need to see that uh, the uh, way you calculated uh, things have, do have impact on profit and uh, also do have an impact on profit uh, in the industry overall, which links it back to industry income. Uh, and the last one is uh, pretty much um, mathematical, uh, which is correlation. So you need to see that indeed, for example, the uh, number of employees uh, does correlate with your profit. So the bigger the number of employees, the bigger is the profit. Or, for example, maybe it's the uh, amount of intangible assets. Uh, to if you want to know more about this uh, topic, particularly quantitative ECA and anchors, uh, I invite you to join uh, the webinar on 19 September, which would be uh, elaborating on this topic and explaining how to do quantitative value chain analysis. Um, but uh, I show you today what how the results of such quantitative analysis could look like. Uh, what it gives you is a comparison between what are your actual results and what are your actual uh, profits in the country and what the profit according to the quantitative value chain analysis could be. And as you see in this example, uh, there is a certain delta, which is uh, the last line called tax risk, that show us that uh, the country is uh, underpaying uh, tax in uh, certain countries and overpaying in another one. So the question is here uh, to actually find out what is the exact reason. So is it the wrong transfer pricing or are there other reasons like commercial reasons for such allocation of profit? And uh, the second is to resolve it and resolve it in a, yeah, in this case, uh, uh, objective way, so you need to find out uh, if you can roll these changes also back or can you apply only the changes forward, depending on uh, how you think the uh, the degree of objectivity of your quantitative PC. Uh, if it's really objective enough, if you really truly think that the uh, allocation through quantitative VCA is accurate, then you maybe even want to apply it backwards and maybe even to request, for example, uh, for tax deduction in a certain country for the uh, previous years. I see still there are no questions, but I uh, just would like to remind you that yeah, you are uh, free to ask. Of course, you can also uh, send us questions after the webinar. So we move here to the second part, which is uh, controversy management. And there are many controversy management instruments, and uh, most of them are available to most taxpayers. Uh, however, uh, the question is what, which instrument to choose and when, and uh, is, uh, are all instruments sufficient for all cases, or is it rather uh, only one or two that you should really use? To answer this question, you actually need to link your instruments to your value chain analysis. So uh, you need to first look at the path. So for example, uh, here you see that uh, the services can be more complex uh, part of your value chain you can use uh, advanced pricing agreements, uh, or even sometimes wait for an audit. So uh, 
in this case, you would uh, need to think of a certain uh, decision, uh, yeah, decision making tree, and uh, answer questions to yourself. For example, which is this is to handle? Uh, so, do you think you actually uh, need to uh, anyhow uh, defend this uh, certain part of your value chain, or uh, do you actually want to leave it as is and wait for an audit? Uh, also, uh, you need to make sure uh, to answer that question that uh, you have all the uh, content uh, required for the chosen instrument. So, for example, uh, if it's an APA, have you prepared the uh, required reports or, and uh, other information? Uh, also, uh, if the content uh, that is requested by the tax authority uh, is not really predictable. So, for example, for APAs, there are certain list of documents that are required for you. But when you undergo uh, an audit procedure, uh, there could be multiple requests that are sometimes even not reasonable. Uh, in that case, you might want actually to switch uh, to another instrument, which could be a resolution uh, through, even through a court. Uh, further, uh, you need to see uh, the process. Uh, that is required for that instrument. So if the process takes you more than two years, again, you need to think of uh, whether the instrument actually worth applying because in two years, uh, too many things can change and then the uh, result that you expected would not be achievable. Um, then uh, the last one is that you need to consider stability uh, of your business model. So uh, if you apply, for example, an APA and fix a certain margin for certain entities for, let's say, three years, uh, is it uh, sustainable or would your uh, business model, like uh, an example uh, of the apparel industry, would your margin decrease significantly and actually that uh, the APA uh, would not, it would not be possible to comply with it because there would be not, there's not enough profits. Uh, to uh, maintain such margin. Uh, in uh, all cases, uh, if you see that uh, authorities are deviating uh, from the process in terms of timelines or content, uh, and also are not giving any, uh, let's say, economic arguments, but are more politically driven, uh, we always advise that uh, you should uh, choose a code from litigation, uh, or a mutual agreement uh, procedure, uh, or maybe even a mediation procedure if uh, tax authorities would agree to it. The last part that um, I wanted to address today is uh, the use of uh, tax technology for full risk control. Uh, I already mentioned in the beginning of the uh, webinar that technology can be used uh, in the first place uh, for the uh, data gathering and uh, assessment, so to ensure the clear reporting and compliance, and also secondly, for more uh, elaborate analytics and planning. Uh, but of course, before you can use it for that, uh, you need to think uh, of the tool to be used. And uh, tax authorities are now uh, implementing uh, various tools in the countries. And in this heat map, you can see the countries uh, that are more and less digitalized. And as you might know, Brazil is the one that is uh, ahead of the curve uh, with uh, its uh, full digitalization of all taxes and also accounting reporting. Uh, that indeed reduced the time uh, for them and also increased uh, the quality of analytics. However, the tax system there is so complicated that it's still, of course, uh, a big issue to file anything there and also to get any proper assessment. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you can see that most of the countries are already introducing certain uh, level of di digitalization. And that means that uh, the taxpayers should uh, also be uh, aligned with that, and they also need to think of uh, tools uh, to perform a similar thing. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, sometimes software providers promise the magical solution to which you're gonna throw all your data uh, and get back all the outputs that you need. Uh, but unfortunately, so far, we have not seen such tool in the market. 
terms, uh, it apparently does not yet exist uh, in this uh, perfection way, but uh, there are rather uh, isolated solutions, so uh, pure separate softwares uh, that uh, can be used for certain tasks, such as preparation of TV documentation or preparation of tax returns. Uh, and there are integrated solutions, so uh, solutions that are uh, part of the uh, ERP systems or even uh, just add-ons to ERP systems. Uh, in any way, they cannot perform all of these functions, and uh, you need to uh, think of what you really want to use. And uh, for that, you can look at the topics uh, for which you want to use, and you can look at functionalities that uh, you can have uh, for certain topics. Uh, of course, you also need to think of how the process for certain topics uh, is organized now. So if you think, for example, of uh, transfer pricing documentation, you need to see who is doing what and uh, which uh, country prepares documentation when. And based on that, uh, think of the uh, functionality that you really need, because sometimes if you prepare, for example, three reports a year, you might not need a software because it's easier to prepare it manually, while if you prepare 100 reports, you uh, might really need to think uh, of uh, automating it. Uh, what I also wanted uh, to uh, elaborate on is that uh, value chain analysis and uh, tax technology are uh, indeed uh, connected, and uh, in uh, such connection, this could become a kind of crime scene investigation uh, where value chain patterns uh, are imported in software and are used uh, to identify that click uh, in the same way as DNA sample. It can also be used as uh, forensic accounting, uh, where value chain data is used to identify mismatches uh, in uh, reporting. Uh, it can also simply be a big brother imposing full transparency on corporates with potential reporting to general public. And it can also become an ERP and tax, uh, where value chain is a center for all uh, tax reporting and analytics, uh, allowing to ensure smooth compliance, risk prediction, and risk mitigation. And uh, in such an environment, I think uh, corporates uh, really need to think of a, a firm strategy uh, for risk management, and uh, they should uh, think how to use uh, value chain analysis technology and controversy management uh, all together uh, to uh, address risks uh, as early as possible and to try to mitigate them. And with this in mind, the question is, what is your tax strategy? And uh, I think this uh, the answer to this question is, of course, up to uh, every uh, corporate and up to every tax manager. Um, um, but uh, I think that the answer definitely should be there, uh, because even if you don't have a uh, tax strategy, that can be an answer. For example, in the countries uh, where the uh, reporting of tax strategy is required, you might want to answer no. Uh, in other cases, I think uh, you need to be really clear what is your approach and how you do things uh, in order to avoid uh, firefighting and in order to avoid any additional costs and uh, stress that uh, this can lead. I would like to thank you all for attending. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, the recording of the webinar and the slides will be shared with you next week.